Houston, do we have long sequence? <laughs> yes. Yeah. I feel like I'm, I'm really loaded for I've got two microphones and uh, lots of other electronics. It wasn't like this 30 years ago when we started. All right. Let's start with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the powerful message that you have in mathematics. We thank you that every time we run the math against evolutionary presuppositions, the evolutionary theory becomes a story. It's only fantasies and vain imaginations. We thank you for this time to look at this famous equation of each one in their understanding. Help me to have the right words for this group. I thank you, Jesus. Name. Amen. All right. Help, can I exist? We have some guests over there. You can see that. All right. On your handout, I've given you the basics. Now, this is just multiplication. It's nothing really very fancy. Okay? So don't, don't panic. Radio astronomer Frank Drake became the first person to start a systematic search for intelligent signals from the cosmos. Using the 25-meter dish of the National Radio Astronomy Observation in Greenback, West Virginia, Drake hosted a search for extraterrestrial intelligence first one, called SETI, meeting on detecting their radio signals. The meeting was held at the Green Bank facility in 1961. There's a picture of it. Part of the purpose of the meeting was to raise interest in other scientists and to raise money to finance the research, of course. All takes money. This is what he said. For the meeting, I wrote down all the things you needed to know to predict how hard it's going to be to detect extraterrestrial life. It is evident that if you multiply all these together, you've got a number n, which is the number of the detectable civilizations in our galaxy. Now, in 1961, this is what he put into the equation. The, uh, we're going to come back to this, but the final, his final, I'm not going to go over his final conclusion was there was a possibility of 50,000 planets with life in the galaxy. And we'll show you that when we add, put in at the end, modern scientific findings, we get a whole different picture. All right, we're going to start with our asterisk, or the rate of stars forming in our galaxy. Okay are the average rate of the formation in our galaxy. In 1995, a dramatic picture from the Hubble Space Telescope of the Eagle Nebula, Nebula showed evaporating gas globules, apes, <laughs> where it was claimed stars were forming. How many remember that picture? I remember it came out at Christmas time. They said this could be the Bethlehem star there. And they promoted it as the beginning of life and creation and everything else. This region is about 700,000 light years from Earth, 7555 light years in size. Astrophysicist Jeff Nestor had estimated in 1995 that hundreds to thousands of stars were currently forming in the 73 eggs found in the nebula. In 2002, with better data from Hubble, this has now been reduced to 11 eggs that may be making stars, they're not really as dogmatic as they were in 1995, all right? Maybe. This is based on a theory of star formation that can only be proven or falsified in seven million years. That's the time it takes for the star to allegedly form. Because when I, I always prick up when they say, oh, stars are forming here, I'll tell you why in a minute. And then when I, I said, okay, well, how do we prove or falsify this is actually happening? It'd be seven million years. So you can never prove or falsify it. The more data we get, the less likely star formation is happening at all. The theory fails to take into account the second law of thermodynamics. Most of you have heard uh, the presentations on this. The law says that all molecular systems and constructs proceed from an organized complex state, similar to this, to one of a diet, uh, disorganized simple state. The measure is called entropy.
entropy increased. Now, here's another mathematical formula called Jean's length. That's it there. You don't have to memorize it for the quiz at the end. But it's all written out there. It's actually more complex than this. This is the basic one, and then you add other things and add more formulas. Sir James Jeans, in the early 1900s, developed a formula that would apply to nebulas. It would, quote, prove that they would form stars or planets when they collapsed. He claimed collapse occurs and forms a star when the internal gas pressure is not strong enough to prevent gravitational collapse of the region filled with the matter. That was the theory, and that was a mathematical equation. And I love this equation because the problem was Gene could not find a nebula small enough to test the theory. All were too big and expanding because of Boyle's law. Major glitch in the whole program. All right, so I have a whole lesson on dust, and I just gave you a compression here. Stop the presses. What about Boyle's law? Yeah, who said you could break my law? The theory fails to take into account Boyle's law of gases. Here is the, the uh, formula P, which is pressure times volume, equals gas at a fixed temperature. This is actually Newton's law of gravity applied to gases. Gases, Newton's law says everything in, that's at rest, everything is at rest or in motion in the same direction forever unless acted on by an outside force. This table is at rest, why? It's, it's trying to go down through the center of the earth. So it's actually not at rest, it's being held down. Uh, if we throw a, a ball up, it's going to go down. And, and of course, the, the story is that an apple hit him on the head and he got the formula. I don't think so. But anyway. <laughs> All right, so now we're going to, I'm not, okay, I'm not attached here, so I'll pull something over. So, we're going to do a special pyrotechnics here. Spielberg, stand back. This is pretty, pretty. So, we have an explosion of gases. Make sure we're not under a fire. <laughs> it hasn't happened yet. All right, now, the gas is expanding. Gases expand equally in all directions unless acted on by an outside force. It's the law of gravity applied to gases. Now, I'm going to push it towards you guys. <laughs> As he was spelled in the first row. And if it gets to the back, now it's going to expand and fill this whole room. If we had a real sensitive meter in the back, it could tell when the little particles get there. Okay? So if it gets back there, you guys in the back row are my expensive meters. Uh, you'll be collecting $100 each at the door from somebody, I don't know who. Right. And so, anybody smell the front row yet? Yeah, okay, so it's moving around. It's, I don't know if they have air conditioning or what, but anyway, that might blow it away. Okay, so, there's our camel and pyrotechnics explosion. About 50 cents worth of matches. Alright, so outward gas expansion is always greater than the gravitational attraction. That's Boyle's law. So how are you going to get these, these galaxies have to break Boyle's law in order to collapse and form stars? So that's another reason we're not getting any stars formed today. Rats, I can't attract anything. All right, the above laws were applied to star and later planet formation in laboratory experiments. It was found that hydrogen, which is the, I bring that up, the most abundant gas in the whole universe. Hydrogen molecules would not stay bound together with silicate molecules, silica is glass, to form dust. They could not form a gas star or gas exoplanet like Jupiter. Problems, problems, and more problems. Hydrogen silicate grains are destroyed by cosmic forces. All right, there's cosmic man destroys hydrogen man. Uh, there are four problems at this step. This is step number eight in the whole Big Bang story. So I'm just giving you step number eight and going to show you why at this point in time planets cannot possibly form from little specks of dust. How many have dust, dust motes in your house? <laughs> yeah. And you know when the sunlight comes through, 
condensing in the sunlight. They're so light that you know, air just blows them up. They cannot create those in the laboratory. I'll show you why. But why would they? Who wants dust under their bed? No. <laughs> they, we have enough problems, problems, problems. Okay, a speck of space dust. This is smaller than the dust mold. This is magnified 100,000 times by an electron microscope. These are dust molds out in outer space. Hydrogen silicate molecules. Very, and, and they are combined into little tiny particles. But here's the problem. Hydrogen is slippery. After one layer of hydrogen, I'm going to turn my sound up. I don't know if it's going to come through the uh, speaker here. Uh, after one layer of hydrogen, yeah, that's not working. Uh, the dust mold cannot grow as the surface is too slippery. So we have Houston. Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> abort, abort. Okay. Sublimation, like rust. How many have rust on their car, especially in Minnesota, from salt? Yeah, there it is. It's called sublimation. It's just rust. Similar to when molecules of metal are washed away by water. Sublimation, in this case, the strength of the silicate molecule isn't strong enough to hold the hydrogen on its surface very long. And the hydrogen sublimates or washes away and returns to gas. So it just dissolves, basically. Oops. I have explosions here, but it's not coming through. But um, you'll have to come back next year. Collisions with hydrogen. Collisions with free hydrogen. There's, there's hydrogen just floating around by itself, and then there's little silicon dust, dust molds that are put together, but we'll see that they had to be put together by God from the beginning. They don't come together by themselves. So uh, the hydrogen atom hits the silicate molecule and cracks it apart. And of course it's the domino effect. Once you hit one, it goes and hits others and knocks that apart. And more knock each other apart, pretty soon you have no uh, silicate molecule to make a dust cloud. These molecules up there in the corner are traveling, this is their data, not mine, are traveling at 150,000 to 21 million miles an hour. What would happen if two cars traveling are they going to make a bigger and better car? <laughs> Sorry. Of course. Yeah. The, the insurance company wishes. <laughs> yeah. We know what happens to those cars. Collisions with each other. Hydrogen and plus silicon particles. When these collide, of course, they're going to blow. Oops, sorry. They're going to collide and they're going to blow apart too. <clears throat> Now, all this they found in the laboratory trying to make dust that would eventually form planets. Now, if you can't do it in a laboratory with controlled, super controlled situation, how can you possibly do it out in outer space? Because the thing they never tell you about these nebulas, that one was 75 light years across. And there's one dust mold, it's maybe, or one silicon molecule or just one hydrogen atom in a cubic mile of cloud. There's all, if you flew a, you know, your spaceship through the nebula, you, you'd hardly see anything. But it wouldn't be like going through a fog here in Minnesota. So, uh, here's the, we have a problem. It is not going to launch to make a planet out of decimals. The laboratory experiment shows it. I found this in a physics <coughs> book, an astronomy physics book, astrophysics book, uh, oh, 30 years ago, over at the library at uh, Brooklyn Center, and I wish I went back to try to find the book again, and, and Xerox on that was gone. So if anyone ever finds that book, it's probably published 30 or 40 years ago, and it wasn't, wasn't politically correct to withhold information. There's no empirical that is seeing, feeling, smelling, or touching tests to prove their story that dust can grow in the planets. The scientific evidence shows there's no way. It would seem that the whole egg theory is now defunct based on this data and the scientific equations. So the rate of star formation, I'm going to put at zero. Caution, star forming today is a story, not science, because science says it won't work. But, you know, in a, if I'm writing a story and I say I, I stepped out the door, flapped my arms, and flew over to Walmart, you say, boy, oh, that's stupid. That's my story. Yeah. I can say anything I want. You said, right, but it's not science. All right, number two. Fraction of stars.
stars that leave that have planets. Okay. The data collected from Hubble Telescope on the left and the Kepler Space Mission Telescope right indicates there are planets allegedly, I'm putting allegedly, orbiting the stars outside our solar system. I'm going to show you that there's seven interpretations of what they're seeing. You only get number one, which promotes evolutionism. A star's spectrum, the light, the light spectrum coming to the star. Mount Palomar, the biggest, one of the most powerful telescopes, and now Keck in um, Hawaii and some of these other ones. When they look at a, a star, all they see is a speck of light. You think, well, they can blow it up, and, you know, like this picture here. They can blow that up and see that. No, they can't. All they see is a speck of light. No matter how powerful it's always a speck of light. What they do is they take this light spectrum coming back, like this picture shows, uh, with hundreds of dark lines, each of which results from atoms in the outer atmosphere absorbing light at specific wavelengths. To find giants uh, or planets, uh, Marcy and Butler took tiny, mystical, uh, back and forth movements in these lines as the stars being tugged by an orbiting companion. So these little lines fluctuate a little bit. Now they're assuming it's being pulled by a planet. That's an assumption. Believe it or not, they have never had a picture of a planet because it's smaller than the star. You know, the Earth, you've seen, maybe you've seen Mercury transiting in front, they'll show pictures of Mercury going in front of the sun sometimes. My neighbor back in Santa Maria had a telescope and he was an astrophysicist from Vanderbilt Air Force Base. He said, come on over, I'll show it to you. So we watched it. But it's just a, it's like a period. In, in this whole room, it would be like a period at the end of the sentence compared to the sun. So they have no pictures. They have all kinds of artists' conceptions and people are going, oh yeah, wow, that looks cool. That looks like Earth. It's all a lie. Well, I mean, it's all a story. Yeah. The problem is that the interpretation of the data is based on assumptions that may be wrong. For example, the light spectrum wobble observed in the stars assumed to be caused by a large gas planet the size of Jupiter. Those that are skeptical of the planet theory, and there's people that are, but of course, you never hear them on the YouTube news. They just say, we found another planet. Everyone said, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, this is good. The theory says it could be a, bi there's, a there's other theories that say it could be a binary sister star that has died and become a brown dwarf. As such, it cannot be seen by our present telescopes. No, here it says a brown dwarf in the solar neighborhood, and this is an artist's impression. Uh, I read an article in Scientific American one time uh, about a woman astronomer, and she totally disagreed with it. I've not been able to find the article again. She says, this planet thing is a bunch of hooey. Could, she postulates that practically all stars started out as binary, a double star, and that one dies, you can't see it, it has no light coming from it, and so that could be causing the wobble. Now, just a little aside here, personal Lowell, uh, suppose that you discovered canals on Mars. How many remember that? I remember seeing pictures of that. And remember, well, that may show how old I am, but uh, Disney made a story about going to Mars. And they found the canals and they found aliens there. Okay? Uh, we should find that on, I've got to find that on YouTube when I get home. Be fun. Uh, Percival Lowell began to notice similar phenomena on Venus. Well, the bottom line was, they think he was actually drawing the reflection of the back of his eye in the telescope. <laughs> because it happens on really high power telescopes. I also heard uh, many years ago, and I cannot find that either, that after he died, they took his, it was a refractor telescope. So it's not, Mount Palomar is a, is a mirror telescope, a reflector. A refractor means the light comes straight through the telescope. And uh, it isn't reflected on a mirror. And they took it all apart to clean it and redo it. And they found that the lens, one of the lenses was cracked. And he was, <coughs> I heard that before this one here. This was a, uh, on a website. <coughs> me. Let me get some. I've been fighting bronchitis for the last three weeks, so. <coughs> all right, so once again, we have some major with assumptions. Possible interpretations of wobble. You make the choice. Right? Planets or vain imaginations, interpreting the data. 
It's a planet. That's what everybody says. Gravity wobble assumption based on light spectrum. It's a brown dwarf, a binary star that has collapsed and cannot be seen next to the sister star. It's solar weather. Events on the star surface that affect instruments so not sure what it is. So that the instruments are not recording what they think it is. They're assuming it's a planet, but it could be weather problems. It's an instrument problem, like the Mars canals discovered. It's the Doppler effect. I don't have time to go into that. If you know what the Doppler effect is, if you want to know more, email me. I'll send you the seven assumptions of Doppler effect. How many have heard of red shift? And that proves the galaxies and everything are expanding apart. That's the first interpretation. There's six other interpretations that have nothing to do with the galaxies expanding. The man that discovered this, based on his work on, uh, I'm going to say weird, but that's not the science term, weird quasars. He found out that redshift has nothing to do with expansion. It has to do with distance and the light coming to the Earth. And as it comes to it, nebulas and other things, the light slows down towards the red shift. There's seven other assumptions. So uh, if you're interested, email me on that. It's a star tug. There may be another star in that area that's tugging on that star, creating the uh, spectral wobble. And, and then seven, it's nothing we've ever seen before. Okay? Just be honest. All right. Number of planets that have echo shells or Earth-like the estimate for echo shells that could support life is based on numerous assumptions, and once again, it's mostly speculation. Planets found so far do not have the unique elements needed for a human, such as we see here. Uh, phosphorus, calcium, nitrogen, carbon, oxygen, 61%. However, if we assume that some of the cold planets are like those in our solar system, we find in its descriptions of them that their environments are extremely hostile, hostile hostile to the formation of life based on the A biogenesis theory of life. We're going to come to that in a few minutes. Life can come from dead matter. More on this later. Here's Venus. Venus, very close to the Earth in distance, and it's almost 95% of the Earth's size. Prior to the 20th century, scientists thought it could be the home to life. Well, they were sure, you know. And then, in reality, Venus has conditions well matched to Dante's vision of hell. <laughs> the planet has more volcanoes than any other planet in our solar system. And it wasn't until, uh, and, do we have any of the engineers left? I uh, know uh, Bob Helfenstein helped put the Apollo 14 uh, on the moon. He was an engineer on that. Um, anyway, I forget when the, uh, I didn't look this up. It was either the Russians or the Americans put a probe on Venus that lasted about an hour and then it melted. Okay. Much of the surface is covered in lava. The surface pressure is equivalent to being more than half a mile under water. Its temperature averages 854 degrees hot enough to melt lead. And it melted everything in the capsule they put there. It, it, you know, it sent back and we learned about these things, took this picture of a volcano. The planet is surrounded by a thick cloud of sulfuric acid, the origin of the term greenhouse effect. How many have heard that in the last week? <laughs> that is actually talking about Venus, not this planet Earth. Its atmosphere is 96% carbon dioxide. You can't breathe. But you get a good carbon 14. <laughs> the result of all this is there is no chance for life on Venus. So, we must not confuse an Earth-sized planet as being an Earth-like planet. They claim, again, and this is all from a spectrum, they, these are all artist drawings, Kepler 20, Venus, Earth, Kepler 20, F. Uh, these are all artist drawings. They claim 1,000 pounds so far, none are like Earth. The discovery of numerous gas giants in close orbit with their stars has introduced doubt that there are life-supporting planets at all. In addition, most stars in our galaxy are red dwarfs, like this painting above, which flare violently, mostly in x-rays, which kills life as we know. No number of Earth planets. There's only one planet. See, if I was going to define a planet, I would say there's only one planet. 
in the whole galaxy, and that's Earth. Nothing else compares to it. <coughs> Fire. A fraction of planets that develop life. Okay, we're going to give them, okay, let's pretend you got a planet. Now, here's our new demo, okay? Uh, I don't know if Spielberg did this, this, but, you know. Okay, we're going to take some good old fashioned oats here, and, and it's available if you need it after class. Yeah. Put that in there. All right? Now we're going to cover this. All right. Now we're going to let that percolate. I'll show you the, the formula, the recipe for making life from dead things. All right? Can life come from nothing or another planet? Yeah, it cannot exist. The whole debate on the origin of life centers around two theories summed up in two words. Spontaneous generation, abiogenesis, and biogenesis. Okay, I said two words, didn't I? I'm going to show you that these two words are the same word, just repackaged. To make it sound scientific. This, I have to see. Thank you, Houston. We'll get on it. Okay, what does Genesis mean? You all know that. It means beginnings. Biogenesis means life in the beginning, or Louis Pasteur posited when he discovered that life comes from light. Irrefutable scientific evidence. A biogenesis, A meaning no, means no life in the beginning. Spontaneous generation. Life came from fire, water, air, and earth by chance and accident. That's what went clear back to Plato, I think three or five hundred BC. That's what he posited. He was the scientist of the day. A biogenesis, dead matter or mud, changed into living matter, which eventually changed into humans. That's what a biogenesis means. This is spontaneous generation that has been repackaged to sound more scientific. Life only comes from life or God. So Adam and Eve, God created man in his own image, in his image of God he created them, Genesis 1, 27. God is, has to come from a living being, and in this case it came from God. 2010. BBC redefines Louis, Louis Pasteur's word biogenesis. They redefine it in this documentary about the Drake Equation. Get it at YouTube or Netflix. It was on Netflix for a while. Life comes from dead things. They took the word that means life comes from living things and redefined it and put it in that movie. I was appalled. Is this science? This is pure fantasy. The Miller Murray. Science magazine announcement 253, life means test tube. I remember when that reading about that a few years later, I was a bit young then. Stanley Miller running his experiment in 1953. This is the actual page from it showing supposedly that he found uh, amino acids that are in the human body. They never told you that he also he found in some of your there's right right-handed amino acids, left-handed. They never say in any of the literature that he found both and they cancel out each other. It's impossible to make life come from a test tube. Uh, uh, this was the test unit, well, you can see it, it's much bigger there, uh, to try to create life in a primordial ocean. Forty years after Miller, the 1992 Technological Encyclopedia claims that the Miller experiment proved life could come from dead things. Again, I read through that. They never said once that the conflict that he found, see, these experiments end up, they're on our side. <laughs> the experiment actually proved you couldn't get life because you get amino acids right hand and left hand and they cancel each other out and you get goo. You don't get a, a, a one cell creature. In spite of the scientific evidence from Pasteur in 1864, under 18, 1992, 198 years, evolutionary scientists have claimed that spontaneous generation can kids still take place to create life from dead things. The same things that Plato and Aristotle said almost 2,200 years ago. The law of biogenesis still proves them wrong. That just when scientists believe that life arose from dead, rotting corpses, because they would find maggots on there, how where do they come from? Well, we know now that flies laid eggs on. 
There they are. When they saw maggots grow out of them, Pasteur proved scientifically that they came from fly eggs. So, 2,300 years of spontaneous generation is an obsolete. Now, here's the Wikipedia. Spontaneous generation is an obsolete principle regarding the origin of life from inanimate matter, which held that this process was a commonplace in everyday occurrence. Well, guess what? They're still using spontaneous generation, only they renamed it a biogenesis, and it's the same meaning. And then in this BBC production about the Drake equation, they took a, they didn't even use a biogenesis, they used biogenesis and redefined it as dead things coming from living things. I mean, I don't know what to say. It's absurd. Okay, here we go. Jean Baptiste von Humboldt uh, in 18. You know, 1500s, had a recipe for making mice via spontaneous <laughs> generation. Put wheat in a dish, then place a piece of dirty cloth over it, let it sit for 21 days, and voila, you have a mouse. Comes from dead things. Now, stand back. And we'll take a look here. See if we got, what, what we've got here. Uh, is anybody afraid of uh, in the front of the mice? If one comes, just stop it, okay? This is science, right? All right, voila! Look at that! <laughs> Holy smokes! And it didn't take 21 days! Good grief. Well, he's a little thin, but whatever. <laughs> See, someone said to me, do you have your doctorate in this? I said, I'm just a pipeline. I just find the information and give it to you. You guys decide if you believe it or not. And uh, here, during that era, Shakespeare, everybody loves Shakespeare, right? Spon I don't know, but anyway. Spontaneous generation is discussed as a fact in literature well into the Renaissance. In one of place, Shakespeare's plays discusses snakes and crocodiles forming in the mud of the Nile. That blew me away. I go to the Encyclopedia Britannica, the reference book for everybody in the world about anything, right? So here's what they say in the Britannica, spontaneous generation. The hypothetical process by which living organisms uh, develop from nothing, from non-living matter, also the archaic, that means outdated, you all know that, theory that utilizes the process to explain the origin of life. And I thought, well, yeah, it's archaic, it's, you know, it's out. Now, here's how they define a biogenesis. The idea that life arose from non-life more than 3.5 billion years ago on Earth. A biogenesis proposed that the first life forms generated were very simple and through a gradual process became increasingly complex. It sounds like spontaneous generation to me. But no, that's out. Now here's what blew me. I look up biogenesis in the biggest encyclopedia and most prestigious in the world. Mechanica does not currently have an article on the topic. Whoa! Below are links to selected articles in which the topic is discussed. There was like three links. I went to them. None of them discussed biogenesis. They didn't even say that Louis Pasteur invented the word. They don't even talk about Louis Pasteur. I was, I was appalled. I didn't think science had reached that low situation. The one link that gave does not, it can just, uh, does not discuss the contradiction, doesn't talk about Louis Pasteur. Wikipedia, everybody kind of puts it down. But they talk about Pasteur's experiment is generally known to have refuted the theory of spontaneous generation. They were bold enough to say that. The same year, Darwin published his Origin of Species. From this came the law of biogenesis, life only comes from life. So there you have it. Science has gone south. I, here's what Louis said, never will the doctrine of spontaneous generation, abiogenesis, recover from the mortal blow of this simple experiment. And you're familiar with that, we'll go into that. Evolutionary rule of thumb. By the way, the long version of this in, power, in uh, PDF file will be on our, our website. This is 100 pages, 100 slides. The long one is, is 250 slides, so you can look at that. Get when the scientific facts do not support the theory, rename the theory and ignore the new data. Yeah. 
The, this theory is a sacred cow. You never change the theory. 150 years of squeezing blood out of a tournament, or rather, squeezing life out of mine. And tax money out of your pocket. For 150 years, they've been looking for life on Mars since Percival found the canals in his eyeball. <laughs> 2017, after 150 years of Mars exploration and suppositions, what are the results? 55 probes to Mars. 50% either never launched, blew up on, on, on launching, or crashed, or never made it to Mars. Those left have sought to find life, but only find a desert world totally hostile to life. Rule of thumb, when we cannot reach the planet, great effort is made to show that it might have life. Because how can we prove or falsify it scientifically? Number two, when we can reach the planet, great effort is made to show that it had life in the past that spread to Earth. And that's why they're going to Mars. Spending our tax money. I, I don't have a problem with exploration, but to try to find life, they're wasting our money. Finally, as with Venus, they admit it is too hostile and life must have come from another planet that we cannot reach. So we still can't scientifically prove or falsify it, and therefore cannot prove or falsify it here. All right, NASA can keep this up, go to one, indefinitely, as long as they get tax money for their next planet adventure. So you see up here, number one, might have life. Number two, well, it had life. We got there, it's gone. And then number three is, there's another planet. We're going we're gonna to go to Alpha Centauri, the nearest star. Maybe there's a planet there. Well, it's, I think it's three light years or something away. It's going to take you know, several hundred thousand years to send the space shuttle there, 25,000 miles per hour. It's not going to make sense. All right, Mars probes and scientific data says no life forms are going to evolve or develop on any planet. And I was going to bring this as a visual. That's my erector set, Mars rover. Uh, so you can get, get your erector set. I, I built one out of Legos one time. I was going to buy one. It was $250 a Lego. I made one out of Legos. All right, F is fraction of planets that develop intelligence. Okay, let's give them one more. Okay, let's pretend a planet is, is life supporting. What do we have there? The fraction of planets with life that actually go on to develop intelligent life. This value remains particularly controversial. Even here on Earth. I'm not sure. <laughs> I call this the dolphin. Hey, oh dude, throw me a ball. Dolphins can learn over 100 commands from their trainers. They can think and reason through complex problems. My wife and I went to San Diego for our 30th anniversary and rode a boat through the, through the area uh, and to look at the things and, uh, and the ships and things. And of course, uh, San Diego is a big naval uh, base there. Uh, we saw one of the huge aircraft carriers. I think it was a uh, Raven carrier. And, but we drove by where they have the dolphins. They have like over 100 dolphins. They're training. They're in open pens. They can jump out and leave any kind they want. They said over 50 years, only three have just left. Maybe they weren't going to get paid enough. But anyway, they, uh, they are very intelligent creatures. They seem to be self-aware, and they work together in their pond. The dolphin principle, they never build anything. See the dolphins there? <laughs> You're wrong, Russ. Dolphins built these towers in Dubai. <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, uh, now, here's an evolutionary man. These are those who favor, there are those who favor a low value for intelligence ever evolved, such as the evolutionary biologist Ernest Meyer. Meyer, Meyer. There are billions of species that have existed on Earth, but only one has become intelligent. This is an evolutionist. He doesn't believe it. Not man. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's debatable, right? <laughs> from, from this, he infers a very tiny value for uh, intelligence. Those who favor higher values for intelligent or attempt intelligence evolving note that generally increasing complexity of life and conclude that the eventual appearance of intelligence might be inevitable, implying FI as being about one. Hey, life always gets smarter and travels to the stars. I mean, we have no precedent for that, but we're still working. Find out that the large spread of values in the factor makes all estimates unreliable. That's not science, that's just wishful thinking. 
It's the dolphin principle. Dolphins have a certain amount of intelligence, just like a dog, but dolphin, they don't build anything. Dogs are great, great companions, very intelligent, great for senile dogs and that, but they don't build hospitals, they don't build houses. I had to build my dog a, a dog house. I asked him to build it himself. <laughs> Civilizations develop technology that releases detectable signs of their existence in the space. <coughs> For 6,000 years, thousands of advanced civilizations have come and gone on the Earth, but only in the last 150 years have we developed radio to send communications to outer space. The Earth has been radiating radio signals for about 100 years. If there was life out there, why don't they contact us? And somebody said, well, maybe they don't want to deal with it. These stupid people, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Yet no alien civilization has ever intercepted the signals and sent us an email. When they found quasars, they really got excited. They sent out a radio signal. It was very consistent, and then they analyzed it more and it turned out it was just a star that's pulsating, pulsating a pulsar, it's called. The message above was a pictograph and math calculations attached to the Pioneer Spacebook probe in 1972. Nothing came back of it. Nothing came of it other than the Star Trek movie, where Voyager came back as an intelligent, advanced machine. Anyone see that one? Yeah. It's a classic. Hi, right, L. Length of time to send off-world signals. A length of time for which such civilizations release detectable signals into space. Uh, this Schumer, using 28 civilization, more recent than the Roman Empire, calculates a figure of 304 years that modern civilizations last. It could also be argued that Schumer's results that the, fail, uh, that the fall of most of these civilizations was followed by a later civilization that carried on the technology, but not ours. The Aztecs had advanced technology. We never inherited anything on electronics from them. You know, how to fly an airplane from the Wright brothers that started back in, what, 1910 or so. The dolphin principle of dolphins do not pass on any technology to the next generation. They have to train each base in San Diego, they have to train the dolphin how to pick up the ball. They can go and pick up uh, uh, explosives and things like that off the bottom, mines and things. But they have to, the next one that comes, the dolphins don't teach the next generation, the naval teachers. Do. The problem is that since none of the civilizations studied in the last 300 years to communicate over interstellar space, the method of comparing L with historical civilizations could be regarded as totally invalid. I don't think they're getting your message. Sending the semaphore to Mars. We would have to put a big old zero in the equation. Summary of criticisms. Michael Crichton, science fiction author and evolution, stated in 2003 at a lecture at Caltech. How many know Michael Crichton? The whole Jurassic Park, he wrote about 15 books, all science fiction. Um, he said the problem, of course, is that none of the terms can be known and most cannot even be estimated. The only way to work the equation is to fill it with guesses. Now, he's an evolutionist, not a Christian. He's an evolutionist. Most of his books deal with evolution, Jurassic Park. The result is an expression that can mean anything means nothing. <laughs> Speaking precisely, the Drake equation is literally meaningless. All right, Jurassic Park. 20 years and $4 billion cost. Congress cut the SETI search for extraterrestrial intelligence. They cut the whole program, eliminated it. And then, if you, just the next year, NASA said, we're going to look for life in outer space. Before, they were just looking to see how the moon was made and things like that. Now, they've taken it up and taking our money to look for another setting, missing link. Running the formula in 1961 and 2017. Does the Drake equation prove we'll find life in the galaxy? Let's run the formula, formula using what we know today. Here's the old formula, and uh, I'm, I'm not going to go through that in detail. 2017 plus Louis Pasteur and the long biogenesis and known data. So, F, uh, fraction of life, assume life always appears, law of the Genesis says no. See, Drake assumed that life always comes. Some eventually it's going to evolve. Well, we can, we've shown scientifically through Louis Pasteur, it will not evolve. It will not come from dead things. All right, so that's ours. That's a zero. Assume number of stars are forming, data says no. I should they're finding with the eggs and that. Assume livable planets around the star, totally unknown. 
There's seven assumptions they have to make to get a plan. And Earth only has life too low of data. Now, Frank cheated when he put in, he put two planets. He said Mars might have had life, so we have two planets. We now know that assumed life becomes intelligent, 0.1, uh, one tenth or one percent there. Um, one assume we can send messages, but the dolphins say no, that, that a planet might be, if there was life there, they could send messages. Now we put the years of 300. Uh, they had put a thousand years, I think, originally in 1961. So what do we get? Has everybody guessed it? <laughs> yeah, I forgot. I forgot my high school algebra, and I was I put it in the computer. I thought, now I'm going to you know, run the figures. I punched it in, it came up zero. I said, whoa! <laughs> then I remembered, whenever you put zero and multiply in an equation, you get zero. So there is the whole problem. So, the astronomer Carl Sagan speculated that all of the terms, except for the lifetime, the length of the civilization, are very high. But he speculated. Sorry, Carl, you were wrong. Exactly. Concerning the current estimates discussed above, uh, we could get a range for n number of planets from 2 to as high as 280 million possible world life, holding life. And as their old man says, that's meaningless. What's the point? Evolutionists do not believe in God. They think that by having neighbors, we have to take this off and get it. Evolutionists, uh, they think that having neighbors either across the fence in our backyard or across billions of light years of space, this will help us to be better, caring, loving people. Where do I get that? Carl Sagan. Anyone ever see the movie? Yeah. The final conclusion there is you have neighbors, so be happy, don't fight, love one another. That's the message in both his, his book and the movie. Now imagine you and your brother have been fighting. Your brother says to you, comes to you and says, you have neighbors. They're looking at the neighbors. So be happy, don't fight, love one another. Wow, that's, the brothers, they're going to stop fighting, right? It's going to be the encouragement. We will act better because we have neighbors. <laughs> imagine you and your spouse have been fighting. Your kids say, you have neighbors, so you better be happy, don't fight, love one another. That's going to really impress them, right? <coughs> Imagine terrorists are attacking you, you yell out to them and say, you have neighbors, so be happy, don't fight, love one another. It's really going to work, isn't it? Some neighbors are slobs and rowdy. You yell out to your them and say, I'm your neighbor, so be happy, don't fight, love one another, and clean up that mess. You all know it's through Jesus Christ living in us that we can come, we can overcome the sin nature and be happy. Not fight and love one another and check out the Beatitudes. There's three chapters there of every possible, everything's covered in the Beatitudes of how to live your life and live it happily. And of course it relates back to Jesus Christ. Alright, I'm going to give you a news release after we're going to, uh, Ross, we're going to, oh, oh, pardon? Yeah, yep. Yeah. So we're ready for that. Let's just bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this equation. It was meant to show that life can exist, and it shows that it can't possibly exist. And we thank you that only life comes from life. You created our lives here on Earth, and that true science, the mathematical equations, prove that. We thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me just add one thing. Somebody came to me and said, Russ, can you prove scientifically that God exists? And I thought a minute, and I says, no. I says, but I can prove through mathematical equations that somebody had to make this galaxy, this universe, because it all runs on precise That's intelligent design. I says, the only way you can know that God exists is if you accept him in your heart. I know he exists. 
Because the Bible says when I accept him, he lives in my heart. And I, in fact, he identifies me that I'm his child. But I can't do that for you. You have to accept Christ, and then you'll know he exists.